This is the new stuff. Don't look at our long track record before and all of our nonsense before. That's old. This is the new groundbreaking stuff. Fresh, hot off the presses. The problem that we have is there's no parental consent. Give par parents the option. <laughs> Harmonious coexistence with Qom Lut, guys. We can hug and have fun together, go on picnics. Harmonious coexistence. We have to make a statement about that we recognize our constitutional obligation to live peacefully with drug dealers or heroin addicts. Why is that necessary? These guys, these charlatans are trying to pull the wool over your eyes so you don't see what's right in front of you. Don't give them that power. Why do they, why are they pleading and begging for imams to sign this? Because they want to bring all of those imams under their umbrella. They did this already in 2016 with a statement. It was called the Joint Orlando Letter. So this was in 2016. And when it came out in 2016, I, uh, you know, criticized this letter. I told imams, please don't sign this. This is really bad. This is, you know, this is normalizing Qom Lut rights. This is normalizing, you know, all of the Qom Lut uh, policies that they want to impose on society and they want Muslims to accept too. So if you look at the signatures on this, you know, it's a long list of people who signed on to this statement and a lot of good imams, a lot of good imams and scholars and a lot of liberals and liberal activists. You have Linda Sarsour is signed on to this, I believe Zahra Billu and a bunch of uh, activists like that who are just pure liberals. This was a collaboration. The thing is that it's so it's worded in such a way that it's difficult for a religious Muslim to immediately see, to immediately understand what is so problematic about it. How is it contradictory to Islam? And the same thing happened with this new letter, this navigating differences. A lot of commenters are saying, or, or some of the imams, for example, that contacted me, I don't really understand what's wrong. Like, it seems to be a good letter. It seems to be perfectly fine, Islamically speaking. But that's the thing. It's coded. It's coded. They take... A lot of things that are unobjectable, uh, unobjectionable, and perfectly acceptable Islamically, and they make sure to foreground those things, and then they bury the bottle, they, they bury the poison in such a way that you won't recognize it. You, you're, you've, your guard has been thrown off, or your guard has been taken down because you see, oh, they're citing the Quran, and they're talking about the Sunnah, and oh, they're talking about how it is important to stand for our principles. Oh, okay, this is going to be fine. So you let your guard down, and then you won't be as easily able to notice the poison. And the poison is everything. Because once you sign on to the statement, you've signed on to all of it. You can't go back and say later that, oh, no, I, I disagree with, you know, just this paragraph. No, you, your name is there. Increasing push to promote LGBTQ centric values among children through legislation and regulations. The legislation and regulations has been pushed for over a decade, right? In the Western world, you could say it's even been pushed for the past two decades in the overall Western world. But in the US, it's basically been in the past decade that they're pushing legislation. They legalized gay marriage, for example, in 2015. There's all kinds of regulations regarding discrimination. There's all kinds of regulations regarding accommodations of bathrooms and different ordinances related to uh, businesses, how businesses can operate regarding, you know, home loot. All of this has been happening for a long time. This is not new, but th what they're pointing out, like as what is troubling still, the new stuff, basically, that now it's being pushed on children. Well, where was your protest when it was being pushed on adults, when it was being pushed on businesses, when it was being pushed on public schools, when it was be being pushed on Islamic schools, actually? Because if you look at the other countries, like in the UK, or even if you look at continental Europe, like Germany or France, this is being, you know, even more aggressively pushed onto the Muslim community at the governmental level through legislation and regulations. Where was the statements? Where was the outcry? Where was the objection, the Islamic objection to all of that? There was nothing. There was just silence. And you get a Yaqeen article about how Muslims must or should affirm and advocate many LGBTQ rights. <laughs> that was the stance of these people okay, who now are, for some reason, troubled by children being targeted. And notice that what they have a problem with is you're disregarding parental consent. <laughs> so this is like a very right-wing conservative way to put it. Like the, the problem that we have is there's no parental consent. If there was parental, give par parents the option. <laughs>
give parents the option. Is that what we really want? We just want to make sure that, oh, yeah, just just teach, you know, the kindergartners and the elementary school children about home loot and how it's a they're beautiful and amazing, but only if you get consent from the parents. And this is what's going to repeat over and over again in this document, in this statement, is appeal to the constitutional rights. You are violating our constitutional rights. We cannot freely practice our religion. What we'll also realize is that this appeal to the constitution, like it's violating our constitutional right to freely practice. Well, the constitution does not, it, it's constantly being reinterpreted, first of all. And when it comes to discrimination policy, this is actually the debate in the US. In other countries, they don't care. But in the US, they say, well, you have religious rights and then you have the sexual minority rights, the LGBTQ rights, and there needs to be a balance. In other countries, they say, no, forget religion. We're not going to, <laughs> we don't consider religious rights. You have to teach this curriculum. You have to uh, stop discriminating in terms of your teaching at your message, in terms of your businesses and employment. You can't discriminate. They don't care about this, you know, a religious right that you have. But that is increasingly the situation in the US. In the US also, the understanding of the constitution is changing and they're constantly trying to put lgbt as this protected class that you cannot discriminate against so if you are a masjid and you uh want to have an imam and you get a bunch of applications and you reject some applications because they are not straight the imam is not straight then this can be considered discrimination you could be taken to court or you could be you know you can be penalized legally for that like that's not the case right now but they're trying to do that they're trying to uh, expand. They're trying to, again, make Qom Lut, this orientation, quote unquote, as they call it, they're trying to make it as a protected class like race or sex. And they're winning. They're winning these judgments in the highest courts in the land, including the Supreme Court. And the people who are writing this document know that. They know that constitutional rights are being expanded to include many LGBT rights. They know that. So when they constantly are appealing to constitutional rights, there is a reason why they're doing that. Do you see where I'm going with this? Think about it and it'll become more clear. So again, you're framing Muslims as a minority when in fact, I think on, on many of these issues, majority of society agrees or a large body of society actually agrees with Muslims that we're tired of this. We are tired of this agenda. We don't want this anymore. We want to actually re revert, reverse certain things. I think that's what the majority of society is actually leaning towards. But again, there's a framing of Muslims as a minority. And again, think about Lut, السلام, the prophet. He was just one man. Like his wife wasn't even on his side. But he stood strong and he told his people, he told Qom Lut to desist. He told them to stop. He told them, he spoke to them in the strongest terms. He said that this, what you're doing is detestable. This is something that is al-fahisha. This is something that is a crime. And he was just one man. And he was able to say this to a much larger group that was attacking him in a very aggressive way. They're positioning Muslims as being on the back foot. Like we have to appeal to the constitution. We have to appeal to your morality. And, and it's not even conservative morality or, you know, a particularly religious morality. It's the constitution because even the left wing agrees with the constitution, right? We're a minority. You, the left wing loves minorities, right? You want to exclude us? Us loyal Muslims, we're, we're such a good, we're a model minority. Why are you excluding us? So they're going to anchor the entire statement and the entire moral thrust of this statement in this kind of way, not in a position of opposition, not in a position of we are on the truth and this agenda, this movement, whatever, this re-engineering of society, pushing modern day Qomlut, we reject that. This is evil. This is satanic. This is going to destroy society. This is going to cause untold harm. It is, it has been on the basis of the Quran. We look at our prophet Lut salam, and we see his example and what he said to his people. And we, that's our model. We're following his sunnah. You don't get any of that in this. You don't get any of that in this. You don't get any of that in any of the statements from these guys, from Yasser Qadi or Omar Sayman. Never, they never will say something 
or they never have said something like that in the future maybe allah guide us all but they have never said something like that in this context while simultaneously recognizing our constitutional obligation to exist peacefully with those whose beliefs differ from ours. Okay, so again, the constitutional obligation. It's important that they keep emphasizing the constitutional obligation, the constitution of the United States or of Canada, because a lot of Cana Canadian imams also signed onto this. They are emphasizing the constitution. Why? Because the constitution, guess what? <laughs> especially in Canada, but also in the US, it is understood legally as being pro-LGBT, pro-LGBT rights. The constitutions of the United States and Canada and Europe, all these European countries, they're all pro-LGBT documents. So when you say, oh, we recognize our constitutional obligation, what they're saying is we accept the obligation that we have to exist peacefully with those beliefs with those whose beliefs differ from ours. You can't read the word peacefully without reading the constitutional obligation because it's peacefully as defined by the constitution. So when the constitution says that, look, this is legal, gay marriage is legal. When the constitution says that it, you can't discriminate in your business or your mosque or your, or your Islamic school or public schools, you can't discriminate. You have to treat this as, you know, this is just another minority that's protected. You can't speak against them. You have to use their pronouns, you have to do this, this, all the obligations, you have to accommodate different bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's being what the left wing is arguing and the right wing has, for the most part, accepted on, on most of the agenda is that those kinds of rights are from the Constitution because the Const Constitution has clauses about e equality, non-discrimination. So what the Supreme Court has done is interpret the Constitution to include these uh, loot rights. <laughs> And they know that, okay, the signatories of this document or the people who wrote this document, like Yasser Qadi, they know that. They, and they've argued that. Jonathan Brown, okay, Jonathan Brown, the guy who's infamous for his uh, passionate defense of Qomlut rights, he's a signatory on this document. Allah alam how much he has contributed to writing it. But he's, he's stated multiple times, like, look, this is the Constitution. This is what the law of the land says. We have to follow the law of the land. Meanwhile, there are many people in society, by the way, non-Muslims who are objecting the law because the law is in the process of being written. Like these are ongoing cases and they are objecting this conscientious, conscientious objection. The laws that are being written as we speak, the court deliberations that are happening as we speak, the sessions in Congress, the sessions in the Supreme Court that are happening as we speak, writing this law. Where is the objection there? Where is the conscientious objection to that? You won't find it in this document and you won't find it in the statements of the aforementioned compassionate imams. You won't find it. Again, why? Conflict of interest. That's what the liberal establishment wants. Normalization. Expansion of Qomlut rights. People who are on the payroll of liberal power cannot speak out. They can only pretend to speak out with meaningless letters like this. I mean, it's not meaningless. It's meaningful. It's meaningful in affirming the, uh, the liberal paradigm. So then this exists peacefully. This means everything. Because they know like what a Muslim, like a religious Muslim will read when they see this. A religious Muslim will say, yeah, of course, Muslims live peacefully. We don't advocate violence against other groups. We are against any kind of vigilantism. We are against any kind of, you know, crimes being committed. We obey the law. We are peaceful. We obey the law. We can object to the law. We can protest the law. We can try to get the law changed, but we obey the law. That's what a, you know, 99% of Muslims uh, will read when they see exist peacefully. But this is the coding that I was referring to, uh, referring uh, to before. Peacefully has to be interpreted with the constitutional obligation. Like what does existing peacefully mean according to the constitution? So uh, the example is the Colorado uh, Baker who there was a gay couple who demanded that this Christian baker bake them a cake for their gay wedding. It went to the Supreme Court. It's constantly being litigated. And the, the Christian baker said, no, that's against my religious beliefs to bake that cake uh, for your gay wedding. And they the gay couple sued him. 
took him to court. This is discrimination. You're violating our rights. And that's that's constantly being litigated because every time it gets dismissed or the courts rule in favor of the Christian baker, they initiate another complaint against this particular baker. So th there's a whole history there that's very interesting. But the argument that's being made is that we cannot exist peacefully if the Christian baker does not bake our, our cake. This is discrimination. This is not peaceful. This is hate. This is bigotry. So, so that's what they're arguing, that the Constitution is considers that to be bigotry and hate, that you're discriminating against us by not baking the cake or by, by not having a, you know, not allowing us to use your bathrooms, for example. So that is the coding that they use. They use a, a word, like they use a term, and they craft the sentence in a way that's not going to be objectionable to a religious Muslim who's not reading carefully and is not thinking about what's the implication of this. And then furthermore, like in, when it comes to Muslim belief, like do we have to make statements about existing peacefully with every group, especially groups that we consider to be immoral? Do we have to make a statement about that we recognize our constitutional obligation to live peacefully with, you know, drug dealers or heroin addicts? Do we have to make statements like that? Do we have to make statements about our constant? We recognize our constitutional obligation to exist peacefully with gamblers, people who gamble. Why is that necessary? To say that and it seems like you know there's this kind of they're playing into the uh stereotype that muslims are just violent <laughs> muslims are violent and i mean this is the ac accusation that's made against muslims but rather than rebut that by saying that excuse me like we're not the aggressive ones here we're not the ones who are trying to ram this agenda down everyone's throat you guys are doing that but you want us to be peaceful how about you be peaceful Muslims live with other minority groups or communities, but we should not view Qawm Lut as a community. That's the other thing. They're not a community. Even to a certain extent, they don't view themselves as a community like a religious community. It's like an activist group, basically, that's just pushing for more and more freedom. Like, we want more and more freedom to do more and more of what you want, to be more and more sexually liberated. How, how can this be considered a community? Like, Islam recognizes communities on different bases, but usually it's on the basis of shared belief. Like, you're a Christian community, you're Ahl al-Kitab, you're a Jewish community, or the kuffar, the, the non-believers, the mushrikeen, the, the uh, idolaters. Like, these are the kinds of communities. But people who just want to expand freedom of choice, sexual freedom, they want to spread fahisha, like that's not a community in the same way. So why should we, they be treated like a community? Like this is the argument that Omar Suleiman constantly makes is that, well, we can work with other communities and look at Hilf al fudul look at, look at the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, look at like how you can work with other groups and treat them as, you know, other communities and collaborate with them. And that's why we have to be in support of allyship with pro-LGBT and with all of these different kinds of Qawm Lut networks. But this is, a, this is a false argument just on the face of it because he's making a false analogy. Like Qawm Lut is not a community in that way. From the Islamic standpoint, that's this is like a group of fusaq. Fusaq, transgressors, criminals, like they're not a community in the sense that Christians are a community or Ahl al-Kitab is a community. So this is just a false analogy that's being made. Now, what's interesting to me, maybe it's interesting to you as well. Why did they not cite these verses or quote them in full? Why aren't they quoting the verses? Because these, this is what the whole statement is about, right? You said that we are grounded in divine guidance or, you know, we, divine guidance is the source of our morality for Muslims. That's what you said in the previous section. And you're citing all other kinds of Quranic ayat. Many, in many places, you're, you're citing ayat of the Quran. That's great. But the whole statement is about sexual ethics and you don't cite the critical, you don't quote them, I mean. You don't quote the central ayat. Why? Why are you not quoting them? Let us read what they are. And, you know, I think it's they deliberately left it out. I think they deliberately left it out because it's not very compassionate when we actually go to those ayat. So let's look at, for example, Araf. And re remember when Lut scolded the men of his people saying, do you commit a shameful deed that no man has ever done before? 
You lust after men instead of women. You are certainly transgressors. But his people's only response was to say, expel them from your land. There are people who wish to remain chaste. So he saved him and his family except his wife, who was one of the doomed. SubhanAllah. So this is a powerful ayat. Very clearly explaining, like in just such few words, the core idea, the core morality, what our orientation, our moral orientation should be about this entire issue. You are committing al-fahisha, you know, this shameful immorality, iniquity. You lust after men instead of women, shahwatan, the shahwa that you have. Okay, You are transgressors, musrifun, right? This is very strong language. And then the response of Qawm Lut, expel them, expel them. They wish to remain chaste or they wish to remain pure. You know, strong. That what does that imply about Qawm Lut? Is that they don't like purity. They don't, they don't like purity and cleanliness and chastity. So he saved him and his family, except his wife, who was one of the doomed. This is going to doom society. This is going to be, this is a destruction that is being referred to in the Quran. So this is so powerful, such a chilling message to humanity. From the Quran, from Allah, the Creator, Azza wa Jal. So this is uh, Surah Al-Araf. They cite it, they don't quote it. Why? Surah An-Naml. Let me expand this. So again, a repetition from Lut. Do you really lust after men instead of women? In fact, you are only a people acting ignorantly. You're people acting ignorant. I guess it's hard to exist, coexist peacefully if you're calling people ignorant. If you're calling them shameful, if you're calling them ignorant, if you're calling them transgressors, if you're saying that they're doomed, it's hard to live, to coexist <laughs> harmoniously, as the document says. But his people's only response was to say, expel Lot's followers from your land. They are people who wish to remain chaste. So this is <laughs> very clear, like what these people are about. So we delivered him and his family, except his wife. We had destined her to be one of the doomed. Hmm. I guess... His wife wanted to coexist peacefully. <laughs> His wife wanted to coexist harmoniously. She wanted to navigate the differences. Let's let's put it that way. See, subhanAllah. Like, isn't that apt? And we poured upon them a rain of rain of brimstone. How evil was the rain of those who had been warned. So matar rained upon them. Their adab. This was Lut Alaihissalam coexisting peacefully? Like it, it was not possible. <laughs> It was not possible because of the actions of those people, the actions of Qom Lut, and also the punishment, the adab that came, that rained upon everyone. So they don't cite that, or they don't quote the actual ayat. And I think there is a very clear reason why they did not do it, because the tenor of this statement does not match the tenor of the Quran. You know what I mean by tenor, right? The Quran and the power and the beauty of the Quran and the insight of the Quran is that it conveys so much in so few words. And just reading those ayat, subhanAllah, you, you just get it. You get what is happening. You get the entire story. You get the entire nature of this issue in just three, four, five ayat. And it, it gives you not only the morality of the issue, it tells you the emotion, what you should feel, how you should feel. Like you just, you get that. It gives you so much to ponder and to think about, about this history, about what happened, what they did, why they deserve that kind of adab from Allah. You get that. You get so much from those ayat. They don't, they don't quote them. They don't quote the ayat. They quote, they have no problem quoting ayat. Like it's not trying, because they're trying to be brief or succinct in their document. No, they quote a lot of other things, but they don't quote those ayat. I think it's telling. Like, for example, they quote the ayat on fornication. <laughs> As God explains, do not go near fornication. It is truly an immoral deed and a terrible way to behave. And so, it's, so it's interesting, you know, what they quote and what they do not quote. Being against fornication, that's not politically incorrect. <laughs> Saying that you will be doomed for fahisha, that is, that is really politically incorrect. <laughs> and... If you want to give the impression that it's all about peace and harmony and coexistence, then you can't have those ayat in your statement. Put two and two together, guys. This is what close reading is about. This is like trying, this is what critical close reading is about. These guys, these charlatans, are trying to pull the wool over your eyes so you don't see what's right in front of you. Don't give them that power. Don't give them that power to control what you think about them and what you think about this issue. We have the Quran, alhamdulillah, is, it's a light and it's a guidance. 
and we will never abandon it. But if you really want to abide by the Quran and follow the guidance of the Quran, then make sure that your understanding of this topic about sexual ethics, about everything is on the basis of that Quran, is firmly on the basis of the Quran to the letter, to the T. That's that's all. Then you can understand like what is happening. Like you will you will know, like you'll just feel off about this kind of statement. Something won't feel right. Like this is not satisfying. Like this is, there's something wrong here. Even if you don't know exactly what it is, you'll just feel it. Some have interp attempted to reinterpret Islamic texts in favor of LGBTQ affirmation. Do you mean like Jonathan Brown? <laughs> Do you mean like Jonathan Brown, who is a signatory on this document? <laughs> Where is he? Where is good old Johnny boy? Right here. Jonathan Brown, signatory. Do you, are you referring to him? Are you referring to Yaqeen Institute? <laughs> are you referring to Re Yaqeen Institute that has tried to reinterpret Islamic texts to allow for affirmation? Like that's exactly what, that's almost verbatim what Jonathan Brown has been saying and pushing. Affirmation. Here are the quotes from the article, Muslims in the U.S., should affirm and advocate for many, but not necessarily all, LGBTQ rights. Not because of quid pro quo, they stood by us, so we have to stand by them logic, but rather because Muslims in the US and LGBTQ groups seek protection for the same rights, ironically, and ironically, arguably have a common vision for the country's future. So yeah, this is amazing how such, such a statement could be published by a Islamic research institute. They have never retracted this article, by the way, like this pro Qawm Lut article. Yaqeen has never retracted it. They've taken it down. They've taken the article down, but they've never publicly, as far as I can tell, retracted it. And if you go to the website, like if you go to the link, published 2017, updated 2022. So almost five years, this article was up. And oh, maybe you can still download it, actually. Maybe you can still download it. Jonathan Brown has, still has this paper up on his personal website, by the way. He hasn't retracted, he hasn't taken it down. Yaqeen has taken it down, but they have not retracted it. Retraction is we made a mistake. This was wrong. We apologize. It's not accurate. That's a retraction. It's not a retraction. It's not a clarification. It's not even a deletion. They just say it's archived. So this is Yaqeen Institute playing games with people's iman. They can't, they can't say they made a mistake publicly about this in particular, because then who's going to listen to them when they're publishing a whole new statement? Uh, so what kind of ethics do we get when we read the Quran? Well, number one message that we get is that sexual immorality destroys people and it actually destroys society and it causes this kind of decay in society itself, but also it brings punishment from Allah. It brings this kind of adab. Uh, that is a huge message in the Quran, and that is a big part of Islamic sexual ethics. But this is something that's seen as offensive, uh, immoral by liberals and the left wing, especially the idea that people would be punished for engaging in sexual freedom. God is going to punish that. How backwards and barbaric. You know, and, and you see like Christian the televangelists will say something like, oh, well, that earthquake or that hurricane, that's because of the immorality of society, the sexual immorality. And you have all these liberals who will laugh and say, oh, these stupid televangelists, they think that somehow uh, what people do in their bedrooms affects the weather and they'll mock, they'll mock uh, the Bible, they will mock uh, religion. Uh, but this is actually an Islamic concept as well, because this is reality. Uh, the punishment of Allah can come at any moment. It can come from above or it can come from below. Uh, it can be through weather. It could be through earthquakes. It could be through um, even angels, malaika, that will come uh, to destroy. So the punishment can come and it is it is tied directly to our behaviors and what we find acceptable. So this is a big, big, huge part of Islamic sexual ethics and our understanding of the universe. But do you see these people talking about that or even mentioning it? They won't even cite, they won't even quote the verses of the Quran that clearly state this. So that's one thing. Okay. Number two, those who openly engage in fahisha they are a uniquely evil force, okay? And part of the reason why is they want to force their fahisha on everyone. Again, that was clear from the ayat of the Quran that we just read. And they want to force everyone to accept and to participate even in their fahisha. So this is something that is very clear. 
part of Islamic sexual ethics. It's a part of Quranic sexual ethics. Number three, liwat, right? Um, this act, this sexual act between the same sex is not like any other sin in Islam. This is considered to be one of the worst, one of the most egregious sins. And it's not tolerated anywhere in the Sharia, in Islamic law. It's not tolerated from Muslims or non-Muslims. So shirk actually and kufr can be tolerated because you have, you know, the concept of Ahlul Dhimma or Ahlul Kitab who are uh, Dhimmis. They can engage in their beliefs um, and their practices with conditions. So that is the Sharia tolerating non-Muslims engaging in their shirk and their kufr. They just pay jizya and they have to abide by, you know, the, you know, that status of being Ahlul Dhimma. But these, these behaviors, like fahisha, like this kind of sexual behavior, is not tolerated at all, whether by Muslims or non-Muslims. This is a part of the sexual ethics of Islam. Four, we do not associate people of desires. Uh, we do not associate with these people of desires or the people who are pushing this fahisha. We do not associate with them. We do not ally with them. We do not work with them. We view them as musrifun, as transgressors, as the Quran says in, in multiple occasions. So that's that's also a very important part of Islamic sexual ethics. And also condemning them is necessary. There needs to be a moral condemnation of those individuals. Not condemning them is dangerous for dunya and akhirah. Why? Because again, there's punishment that will come. If you don't condemn, you will be punished along with them. And this is this is what, again, all of the, these ethics are found in the ayat that we read, right? Because the wife of Lut was punished. Why? She She did not condemn them. She condoned them. So she was included with them, even though she herself was not involved in that kind of fahisha. So this is an important part of the sexual ethics uh, of Islam. Did you see any condemnation in this document, like any inkar so far of these people of modern day Qamlut? Was there any inkar? No, there's just we exist peacefully with them. We want to coexist peacefully with them. And then we do fifth, we do not support people's right to engage in fahisha. Again, go back to Lut in the Quran. Did Lut say, I respect your right, I affirm or I acknowledge your constitutional right to practice, you know, this behavior? Did Lut say that? Like this document is saying? No. So we do not see anything like that. So we cannot support anyone's right, supposed right to engage in fahisha. And to engage in this kind of iniquity, this enormity. So these are just five ethical principles from the Quran, just related to the two or three ayat that we read about Lut Is any of this found in the document? Like a lot of people will criticize this document. I've seen people criticize this document and they'll say, oh, well, it gets the, it says Islamic morality. It gives the Islamic moral position, but it just ignores the political issues. It ignores like the political side of the equation. Uh, I've made this point before. You can't really separate morality from politics. Politics is inherently a moral enterprise. That's number one. But number two, this document doesn't even get the morality right. It does not properly convey Islamic sexual ethics. It distorts sexual ethics by omission. It distorts Islamic sexual ethics in the tenor of how it is dis discussing the issue. It, it distorts the issue by making it into this kind of very uh, dry, almost neutral type of statement, like as if, again, like gay sex is haram. Okay, you, you can state that as if you're describing some position in fiqh. Like, okay, it's it's haram. Okay, we know that. But where when we read the Quran, it's condemnation. There is very emotional language that's used. There's very vivid language that's used that, that gives you the kind of orientation that you as a believer have to have on this issue. Wait, did I miss the sentence? Oh, I, I, I missed this uh, amazing sentence. Such coercive ultimatums undermine prospects for harmonious coexistence. We want to be buddies. Harmonious coexistence with Qom Lut, guys. We can hug and have fun together, go on picnics. Harmonious coexistence. Don't undermine the prospects, guys. The prospects. We can, we'll have so much fun. <laughs> if only you just be nicer. Let us have our constitutional rights. We gave you your constitutional rights. We acknowledge them. We acknowledge your constitutional rights, guys. Come on. Don't undermine our prospects for fun. 
we do so much together. Just imagine, like, that's what these co compassionate imams are saying. This is what they're saying. <laughs> this statement, call on policymakers to protect our constitutional right. Oh, so now you want to call on policymakers. Oh, okay, now we should call on policymakers. What about for the past 10 years? Oh, when, when Yasser Qadi told us not to get involved? <laughs> there were a number of states that had voting for LGBT. California Proposition A, famous example. And I got calls from California, what should we do, should we vote or not? And the majority of ulama said you should vote to ban it. I was one of the few that said, no, you shouldn't. Don't try to go become their enemies because it's actually gonna harm you in the long run. But then neither, should, in my opinion, should you vote for it. I said, just don't vote. <laughs> and that, oh, more of their rights means more rights for us. The more freedoms any group is given, the more freedoms we are given. Therefore, in some ways, it is helpful for the American Muslims to ally with the LGBT community. You know, all of those statements that we documented in Dark Legacy. In political issues, honestly, those people are of the most understanding of our plight and the most supportive of, of campaign, campaigning against Islamophobia. And they're very sympathetic to our plight. Why can't we take their help? Now we have to talk about policymakers. Contact your, your senator. We have to get involved politically. We have to get involved with every other issue. We have to protest migrants. We have to protest, you know, whatever feminist cause. We have to protest reproductive rights. Like all of these compassionate imams do. They go and protest on Washington, D.C. And they even get arrested. You can find pictures of Omar Soleiman in handcuffs in the Capitol. He is protesting the mistreatment of immigrants and migrants. Brave stance, protesting the government. But he can't protest anything else, I guess, on the basis of Islamic values. Not on this issue, at least. That might undermine prospects for harmonious coexistence. They are saying they're working on this statement for weeks. Like, imagine, you're working on this statement for weeks to just say that gay sex is haram. <laughs> Like it took weeks for us to think, it took us weeks for to say that our morality is based on the Quran. It took us weeks to craft that statement <laughs> as if they're like making such a, oh, this is such a deep and carefully crafted, like really navigating complex issues, like deep into the fiqh, deep, so deep into the Islamic sciences and the uloom. We had to really bust out the books of Tafasir and Usul al Fiqh and Nahu and Sarf, and we had to pour over text after text, researching nonstop. We were really burning the midnight oil to produce the statement that gay sex is haram and there are two genders. <laughs> so <laughs> they're so proud of it. They're, they're so proud of, you know, yeah, groundbreaking, groundbreaking statement. Yeah, that's actually what, what a bunch of them said, right? Our groundbreaking statement. <laughs> We've really broken new ground here, guys. <laughs> they have to say that. They have to say it as if this is something new so that they can, they can justify. They say, see, this is, this is the new stuff. Don't look at anything before. Don't look at our long track record before and all of our nonsense before. That's old. This is the new groundbreaking stuff. Fresh, hot off the presses. Hot off the presses. We, we poured over this for weeks. Unprecedented, groundbreaking. <laughs> Okay, troll. Maybe you should rewrite it. I just did rewrite it line by line. I did rewrite it. And that's where the critique that is, is to say how it's wrong and what is the correct alternative. That's what I just did for three hours. Did you miss it? But here, I'll, I'll, I'll rewrite it very simply. Here, Muslims, you want a statement for your community on LGBT? All you got to do is go to Surat Al-A'raf verses 80 through 83, print them out. Print them out, print it in gold, these ayat, and sign underneath it. Sign underneath it as a humble slave of Allah, that we submit to these ayat of Allah. This is our statement. That's all you have to do. If you're so confused, oh, well, how are we going to address Qom Lut? How? What kind of statement? It's just so difficult. It's, it's so difficult to talk about this. Oh, it's, we're just conflicted. We have, to, we have to draft. We have to spend weeks drafting and debating how, what kind of statement can we make? And then at the end of that, 
after how many years? Like it's 2023, and the most that these guys can produce is still gay sex is haram. Like that's the most that they can say. There are two genders. That's the most that they can say. That's the level of discourse. After in 2023, how long have we been dealing with this issue? How long has there been this, as they call it, social pressure? And this is <laughs> this is all that they can say. Like their groundbreaking statement. So if this it is uh, it is so vexing, like as for for you guys, it is it is so vexing to to make a statement about Qaum Lut. Here, I'll make it very simple for you. I'll make it very simple for you. Just go to the Quran, Surah Al-A'raf, verse 80 through 83. Print this in gold letters. This is our statement. This is our statement. It says everything. It says everything. Or maybe we'll go to Surah Al-Naml. Print these, okay? Verses 55 through 58. Just uh, just print, you know? And, and sign it. There you go. Khalas. So simple, right? It doesn't require headache. It doesn't require vexing this tortured, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to say? Oh, they're going to come for us. <laughs> come on, guys. Come on. It's not that complicated. You know, but it, if you just print and you print the statement and you read it and you understand it, go to the tefasir of it. Go to, go to the uh, tefasir and see what the scholars have said. See what the sunnah of Lut alayhi salam actually is. Be like Lut, okay? You want a statement? You want a statement on LGBT? Look at what Lut says, alayhi salam. Everything that Lut, Lut alayhi salam, the prophet, says in the Quran, repeat it. That is your statement on LGBT. Khalas, done. Finished. Assalamu alaikum. La tansaw la ajaba bil video wal ishtiraka fil pana. تشجيعا لنا لنستمر بنشر المزيد إن شاء الله